speaker. It's Anes Bernier from the University of Chicago. So let me give you a few words to introduce the speaker and set also some rules for engaging the lecture, and then we can take it away. So Anes actually is assistant professor in Chicago, but before that, he studied in Germany, in Hanover, if I am not wrong, and did PhD in the Netherlands. And at that time, he was working about entanglement of objects over large distances. So for instance, one of his most recognized works, it's about entangling electron spin over distances of three meters in diamond. So it's about really trying to scale up quantum mechanics to the microscopic world, but this was not enough. He then went to Harvard for his postdoc, working with Michel Lukin, and actually led one experiment that opened a completely new frontal research on Rydberg atoms. So he was first author of the first scalable Rydberg array simulator for non-ergodic dynamics. It's actually a paper that quite much was a breakthrough in the field, so it changed the way in which theoreticians were looking at Rydbergs, and it sparkled a lot of very successful experiments afterwards in Michel Lukin lab. And he's now actually leading his own group in Chicago, I think, since four years, if I'm not mistaken. He's combining both this expertise that he got at his PhD and doing his postdoc. He will be giving a very experimental-oriented lecture, and as it was for the previous week, please, whenever you have a question, just raise up your hand and I will walk to you and we'll pass the microphone so you can be interactive and people on Zoom can listen what you're saying. So you maybe let me know if you see a question, right? Because I will be looking at you. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can take it over whenever you like. All Thanks, right. Sebastian. Yeah, thank you so much, Samir. Wow, it's wonderful to be here. It's my very first time, actually, in uh, South America at all. So I'm really excited to be here, and uh, I hope to explore a little bit, and maybe we can explore together. Um, yes, so I'm the only experimental speaker. So I don't know, are you excited about experiments? Do you want to know how we build these things? Okay, okay, good, good. That's what, what, what these lectures will be about. Uh, Basically, I would say, um, and, and oh no, this is not a pointer. Let's do like this. One second. Basically, I think uh, I mean uh, this is a wonderful summer school. But often, what we like to do is like we have little toy models. We have like spins, and spins maybe they flip around, and we study their non-equilibrium equilibrium dynamics. We have these dimers on some interesting lattices. Uh, but in the end, okay, how are these things done? Okay, it might actually look like this. So, 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 so very, very different. And my only goal, actually, for the, for the lectures is that you can somewhat make the connection between, okay, what you would like to do, maybe, in, in, in theory, or here, even uh, in, in quantum information processing or many-body theory, and how we actually do it in the lab. Um, wait, let me just see. There's a chain. Ah. Oh, super, yeah. Uh, we are also very excited. Um, <laughs> okay, so, so, so the, uh, that is the goal, to, to make this connection. And, okay, the experiments that my group and actually uh, many, many groups uh, work with are cold atom experiments. And cold atom experiments, they are quite special because um, yeah, it's a very well-controlled system. And I will kind of give you the tools, all these little uh, control methods that you have to then really even assemble like single atoms that then behave like these spins or that behave like these dimers or that you could use as qubits in your quantum uh, processor. So that's why my lecture is quantum information processing and simulation with Rydberg atom arrays. All right, and then let's make this very interactive. So if you have questions, uh, that's actually much better than just me giving a monologue. So anytime, just raise your hand. And if I don't see it, just shout. So I will do it kind of here on the iPad. I am also happy to uh, later uh, upload the slides. That's possible, I guess, or, 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 or this uh, stuff. So, okay, just, just uh, so I am Hannes. Uh, last name is uh, Bernin. Uh, okay, and I'm at the University of Chicago. And okay, th this is the big spiel. We want to make this connection. But let me break it up a little bit into an overview of the lectures. Um, so roughly there will be three. And in the first 
maybe a little bit of second lecture, we are going to talk about single atoms. Uh, as, and when I think about atoms, I kind of think of them uh, like our building blocks, as quantum building blocks. Okay, this lecture will be about, okay, how do we get to the point where we can actually hold a single atom, and then how do we control that single atom, and then how do we make atoms interact to then maybe behave like interacting spins. Uh, that interaction, that, that's where kind of this name comes from in, in the title, and it's going to uh, be done via Rydberg interactions. Uh, Rydberg interactions, and just very briefly, Rydberg interaction, a Rydberg atom is just your usual atom. Every atom could be a Rydberg atom, but okay, what, uh, what is special about Rydberg atoms is that you basically excite them to very highly excited states. So you basically take this electron and put it on, I don't know, uh, maybe the 100 shells, something crazy. And then actually everything about the atom becomes pretty crazy, actually. Uh, atoms suddenly have ginormous dipole moments or polarizability, and that's how you get really strong interactions, and that's what we are going to use. And that has become really popular uh, right now. Maybe we will dive a little bit into quantum information processing, how these interactions can be used there. Uh, but then we spend time on how those arrays can then be used as uh, simulators. Um, and, um, and I'm going to maybe highlight what is happening in the field right now. Maybe even a little bit what's happening in my lab. Um, yes, so feel free to interrupt any time. Uh, now we will start, and, and we start with number one. So, okay, we should, would, okay, now I want you to get into the experimental mindset. And what experimentalists do when they set up a new lab, uh, the first question they always ask is, okay, uh, which atom? So, so that's always a, a good question to ask, which atom do you want to use? So we should have a look at uh, typical atoms. Of course, uh, there are... Um, many atoms, and okay, let me get a periodic table here. I, I, I just copy this over. Uh, y y you can get those lecture notes. So, so oh. okay, so so here periodic table. Okay, so, so some are blue, and okay, blue colors here. Uh, Blue are atoms that have been laser cooled. So we will go a little bit into laser cooling later, but basically you want lasers to interact with your atoms. And you could imagine maybe some atoms, they like to be excited. Some atoms, they like to be excited maybe at wavelengths where you can get lasers. So, so there's some... I think matchmaking between, okay, technological, what is available, what kind of lasers, what kind of wavelengths do I have, have, and then atomic physics, what kind of atoms actually respond nicely to these lasers. Uh, that, that's why not this whole table is blue, uh, but you see a lot of blue actually when you look here in, the, uh, in this very first column. So this first column, the first uh, group, is a group that is very often used, often experiments use atoms uh, with one with one extra electron. So that's that's um, that's of course yeah just the uh, first group. I mean, um, hydrogen, maybe in the beginning was used, now not so much anymore, but lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium is very famous, cesium, and then as you go lower, francium is actually radioactive, so, so it's not so often used, but some <laughs> experiments actually uh, do also experiments with uh, francium. 
And why is that the case? Why, why, why do we like to use these? There's nothing super fundamental, uh, fundamental about it, but you can imagine if you just have all the shells filled, and now you have one extra electron, that, that's what this group uh, one is, then basically all your transitions are somehow this electron jumping between different shells or different orbitals, uh, and, and that gives rise to what I would say an easy level structure. So something that we can <coughs> understand and control well. And maybe the prime example of easy level structure is um, rubidium. So you will see many experiments uh, that work with rubidium. And that's, I don't know from whom I stole this, but somebody says rubidium is the silicon of atoms. So in, in semiconductor physics, you like to work with silicon. In atom, atomic physics, you like to work with rubidium. And actually, I mean, atomic physics and experiments there uh, are, yeah, there's a huge tradition. It's, it's, it's very long. And, and okay, p some people get bored working with uh, rubidium. And then they uh, look a little bit wh what is maybe the next more interesting atom. And maybe we also talk about it in this kind of last part of the lectures uh, when we talk about new frontiers. Um, for instance, now a lot of people are excited uh, about using two electron atoms. So that's your uh, second group. It's also your alkaline earth uh, atoms. So that's, for instance, ytterbium, strontium. Uh, the, these atoms have a more complex level structure, <coughs> which both... Um, Okay, makes it more uh, complicated, but also gives you new opportunities. And what people are quite excited about right now, um, opportunities um, is that ytterbium and strontium, they are used, for instance, to make the best optical clocks, so the best clocks in the world. Um, <coughs> so they have very narrow line transitions, so-called optical clock transitions, and you combine those. Uh, you can combine those with all this Rydberg array stuff we are going to talk about, and make maybe even better clocks. Um, and then there's a lot of excitement right now, maybe about ytterbium, uh, because ytterbium can have a ground state that is only a nuclear spin, and a nuclear spin can be very coherent. So if you think about um, making maybe a quantum computer and use these things as qubits, you might be quite intrigued by ytterbium because it has a nuclear spin that is highly coherent. But okay, um, other than that, I, I would say all, in my mind, all the atoms are pretty much equivalent. They are just your building block, and you just have to decide, okay, which building block maybe fits your experiment best. But okay, once you decide it on an atom, actually as an experimentalist, it's not so, diff uh, not so easy to change anymore. Because suddenly you have this atom, and as we will see, to control this atom, you need many, many lasers, let's say on the order of 10 different lasers at all different wavelengths. So now if you want to change atoms, okay, you in many cases just have to <laughs> build a completely new setup and get many, many more lasers. Um, yeah, those are the struggles of experimentalists. Um, so, okay, so, but okay, independent of what atoms you pick now for your experiments, let's have a look uh, what a typical setup looks like. So, so where do these experiments happen? Okay, I've already shown you a photo from, from the experiments uh, in my lab. But okay, let's, there's a lot of optics, a lot of lasers. Let's peel all of that away. Uh, and, and when we do that, uh, you will see some kind of structure. Okay, I'm not great in drawing, but let's try this. Maybe some, some kind of cube or maybe circular thing. Uh, and, and this this is our uh, vacuum chamber. All of these experiments, they had uh, happen in vacuum. And it's actually not even enough to just have, I don't know, your standard vacuum that you can do maybe with a pump uh, or a simple pump, but you really want ultra-high vacuum. 
So ultra high vacuum, uh, what does it mean? It means maybe you have pressures of 10 to the minus 10 or maybe even 10 to the minus 11 torr. That's actually better vacuum than in, in some parts of the uh, outer space. And that's kind of ideal. So, so you have like a big <laughs> volume of nothingness. And now if in this nothingness you could trap these single atoms, then basically these atoms have nothing around to interact with. So they are extremely well isolated. And that makes uh, these experiments, uh, I think, so intriguing that you can isolate your quantum system from the environment so well. Very different from if you had like a crystal or something. And okay, it's not just enough to, okay, my drawings is really not good, but let's do this. So you need some kind of, let's say, vacuum pump. Um, and we will see some pictures of this. Uh, so, so, so you have this cube, you attach your pump, it's a very powerful pump because you want to go to 10 to the minus 11. And then, okay, if you have really nothing in your setup, that's also not good because, okay, now you have nothing to experiment with. So you need some atoms. And in the simplest case, if, if, if you were really uh, doing it uh, very simple, you could, in principle, actually just put a little piece there. So this could be your atom source. Um, and this could just be uh, a piece of... Uh, rubidium, for example. So you could put like a little piece there. It's it's solid, but even like a solid has some vapor pressure around it. So some in equilibrium, there will be some vapor pressure, a little bit of uh, rubidium floating around from that solid. Um, that, that, that doesn't work for all atoms. Sometimes maybe you have to put those atoms in a little oven, make it a little bit hot so that atoms actually like to be also uh, in the gas phase. Uh, but for many atoms like rubidium, you could really just put a little piece there. And then, okay, the, the last thing that's missing in my uh, simplified setup here is in the end, uh, you need a lot of laser beams. So, so, and, and, so, and actually, because uh, the first steps in these experiments will be that we want to laser cool the atoms. We want to cool the motion of the atoms in all directions. And actually, to do that, we need... Uh, laser beams from all directions. So that's why these vacuum chambers, they often have windows on them and, and you can send in laser beams from all directions. Yeah, question over there. Oh yeah, let's give Jamir some exercise here. <laughs> Here's another one. Oh, it's back. So, Professor, the kind of cooling that you use is like uh, Doppler cooling or stuff like that? Or it's a different one? Uh, no, no, no. It's a, it's a great question. So, so we will get into that. So, so the question was, is it Doppler cooling? And, and um, there's Doppler cooling, sub-Doppler. There's actually a whole family of all kinds of cooling. And, and Doppler cooling, I think, if, if that's what you have in mind, is kind of the standard laser cooling that allows you to go to a temperature that is in the end set by a Doppler limit. And, and, and the Doppler limit is basically, when I excite these at, yeah, basically it's related to the motion and, and how the atom sees the laser light that is detuned. We will not go into all kinds of variants of laser cooling, or, or we could if, if that's desired. But uh, there's, I mean, there's so much uh, laser cooling. In the end, actually, Doppler cooling will not be enough to be cooled enough. So you want to do sub-Doppler cooling. And there are many different ways. And, and the most easy one is maybe polarization gradient cooling, or sometimes it's called Sisyphus cooling. And, and that's what we are going to use to get to low temperatures. Uh, yeah, but I will actually not cover it so much in detail, but I'm happy to talk about that uh, with you. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Another question? Cool. Um, so, so just like dumb questions, but like, um, so like in order to have this vacuum, right, like and still have rubidium in, like somehow, like do you first like turn on the, the, the pump, like make a vacuum and then put the piece in or uh, how, how, how does this work like in practice? Cause yeah. I'm just, yeah, I'm just w worrying that like this rubidium will also get like sucked up or something. 
Um, well, this uh, rubidium is, is just like a salt, or it's, it's like a solid piece, and, and, and uh, all of this setup, sometimes people advertise that because, for example, in quantum computing, you think about maybe all these dilution refrigerators and these cryostats. All of this here is at room temperature, so, so we are not necessarily heating it up or cooling it down to the touch. It's really just that we cool these atoms. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm really kind of making a very simplified picture there where, where this is my UHV chamber. Um, modern experiments, they don't necessarily do that because uh, having like really the atoms in the same chamber might make the pressure not so good. So, so then maybe you are not at 10 to the minus 10 or so. That's why you often like to have like a little separate chamber where you have your atom source. Uh, and maybe here you have a little piece and, and then you could connect these two chambers with a thin tube or so. And this is called a differential uh, oh. uh, pumping tube. And what this allows you to do is uh, that you can have maybe here you have 10 to the minus 11 tor and then here you have maybe only 10 to the minus 7 tor or 8 maybe. So you can have vastly different vacuum and then here you have maybe your cloud of atoms and then you can actually use a laser beam laser beam to push these atoms through this tube and, and to uh, catch them over there again. That's a more modern version or that's actually how most experiments look like uh, now. So you separate the bad vacuum, but okay, you need to start with some atoms, so somewhere there have to be atoms uh, from the really good vacuum and you uh, connect them through this differential uh, stage. Thanks. Oh, a lot of experimentally minded people in the audience, great. Yes. Yeah. Super. So I work with atomic medium, and uh, the uh, normally we use a, mag a optical magnet called trap, and I curious because usually we use vapor, mm -hmm. and. Which, which type of mechanisms I use to analyze the soil, soil piece of ruby? I, I want to understand. Wh which kind of magnets? Or so? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, so far in this story, there are no magnets yet. Uh, later in the story, and oh man, so many detailed questions, I didn't really expect that. Uh, later, actually, to trap these atoms, you need optical fields. And you also need magnetic fields, so, so there will be some magnetic field coils around it that um, oh, I have different colors. Uh, and, and, and these magnetic field coils, they are in an interesting geometry. Um, so this is B field. Because in the end, uh, you want to make a cold cloud of atoms, and, and you make this cold cloud of atoms where, uh, where this magnetic field is uh, zero. So, so, so you uh, make a configuration where the atoms want to go where the magnetic field is zero, and if they go in any other direction, then they will be kind of pushed back to the center. So that's a magneto-optical trap, I think, that you were referring to. So those uh, things are really important. But works with a soil pay a piece of rubidium, too? Uh, no, this doesn't work with the solid piece. This solid piece of rubidium, it's not that we pick up the solid piece and do the experiment with. It's more like there's a little solid piece, and around this solid piece, there's a little bit of a vapor pressure. So, so, so there are atoms here in this vacuum just coming out of this solid, and, and those are the ones that we pick up. And sometimes that's not enough, so sometimes we might have a little coil here to, to heat whatever... Uh, atoms we have there to, to make it evaporate a bit more. Thank yeah. you. Okay, cool. Are we good? More questions? No? Okay, great. Thank you. That's excellent. Um, oh.
So in this very simple, and, and your, your questions already went much, much deeper, but, but let's uh, dial it uh, back again. So, so in this very simple setup, we just load atoms uh, from room temperature vapor. So that's just the piece uh, of, of, of atoms that sits there. Or, or we need to heat them maybe a little bit up, and then we have an atomic oven and get atoms from there. And that's uh, the, the first ingredient. And then the second ingredient is always laser light. Uh, and laser light, we will see, will play so many um, roles. It will be cooling. will also be trapping. It will be state preparation. Um, and it will be measurements. I mean, everything is laser light, basically. Um, Okay, so so really bad drawing, slightly better drawing. Uh, I, I will show you, I refer to, okay, we can first look at this setup. So this is now what, what it looks like in the experiment. But okay, you don't see so much there. So I also took a picture when it was a little bit more empty. So this is, uh, this is what it looked uh, like maybe two or three years ago. Let's put this here and let's try to identify well, it's not so easy. Let, let's try to identify some of those parts. So actually here, um, this whole thing, like this metal thing, and that goes down here, this is all the vacuum chamber. And in this setup, okay, it's, it's exactly, I don't know why, it's exactly this configuration here where Okay, it's not just a simple piece of atoms that sits in there, but the atoms actually, they start up here. So this is an atomic source. But the idea is exactly this. So, so it's a part of the vacuum chamber that has much worse pressure. And from this part, atoms are being pushed down with a laser beam. And then down there, here's actually where all the experiments happen. And this is also where you see those magnetic field coils that you were already uh, uh, referring to. You, I mean, I kind of laugh about these experiments. A lot of it is actually done by hand, kind of. You see <laughs> that we kind of wrapped around some, some wires there, and that makes the magnetic field. And then very important, as we will see later, these things that you see here, and uh, they are microscope objectives. Microscope. Oh, too bad. And that will actually allow us, and, and I will show you how, to, to hold single atoms and then to image uh, single atoms. So what I really love about this uh, experiment is that there is actually so much uh, different technology that goes in here. So, so, of course, we have a lot of vacuum technology. Uh, then you have a lot of laser technology. You have lots of optics. That's why this later picture looks a little bit messy. There are so many uh, mirrors around it. You have a lot of electronics. And then... Later, you, I mean, to detect the atoms, you have cameras. And, okay, there's a lot of um, yeah, computer science or programming uh, to, to actually uh, run these setups. So all of these things have to come together to make this happen. But now let's look a little bit under the hood. We have our vacuum chamber. We have maybe our piece of atoms in there, or maybe we isolated it a little bit more. So we have this like very dilute vapor of atoms that we are interested in. So there's a whole lot of nothing. And let's just for argument's sake say there are a few rubidium atoms that now buzz around in this vacuum chamber. Um, so here, let's, let's, you ask me questions, I ask you questions. So what do you think an atom at room temperature 
of course, still moves around. What do you think is the speed of the atom? So basically, in the room here, if atoms weren't crashing into each other. Sorry? 200 what? 200 meters per second? Yeah, or more. Yeah, that, that's very good. Like, if, if you had asked me the question, uh, I would have probably said 10 meters or so, but they're actually pretty fast. Uh, so this is actually a few hundred meters per second. Excellent. So atoms at room temperature. Atoms at room temperature travel with, and if of, if of course, depends on the mass of the atoms, uh, but yeah, it's a few hundred uh, meters per second. So, okay, that's way too fast. Uh, we basically want them stationary, uh, so we have to slow them down, and that's laser cooling. And okay, I'm not even, or well, I could, but I'm not even going into subdoppler cooling. I just want to kind of give you kind of a hand wavy, intuitive picture of what laser cooling is. Um, and maybe some people are doing laser cooling. This is a little boring, but here's my uh, like hand wavy, intuitive picture. So, so um, okay, atoms are too fast, need to cool. And okay, let's now imagine we have our single rubidium atom. And single rubidium atom is traveling, let's say, really fast in this direction with, uh, uh, with 300 meters per second. And let's imagine this atom has a level structure. So I will always draw these kind of energy level um, diagrams. Often we just simplify it to two levels. Actually, that will be basically our goal in the end. We want to maybe treat them as spins or qubits. So, so we want to just draw two levels. Um, but what those two levels are might depend a lot on what we are doing. Right now, those two levels I'm drawing would not be the ones we would use as a spin or a qubit because we want to now work on an optical transition. And this optical transition for rubidium would be for instance, between the 5s state, so 5 is the principal quantum number, just all shells are filled, and the fifth shell has this one extra electron, and then s is the orbital angular momentum, and an s shell is just a totally spherical symmetric wave function. And, okay, the excited state, when I shine a laser on it, uh, might be the 5p state. So it's still, the electron is in the same principal quantum number, but now the orbital changed to this p orbital. And that's actually quite an energy difference. So, so, so to go there, you need a laser with 780 nanometers about that. So, 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 so you send in a photon of that light. Uh, and often, okay, we don't want to exactly send the photon on resonance, so, so we might have just a slight detuning here from this excited state. Um, so this is the situation. We have a laser beam like that, and now we send this laser beam from this direction, and let's just treat it as maybe a one-dimensional problem, because uh, we said we want to cool in all directions, but now let's just think about this x direction, and I have now my laser beam with a frequency I might call omega coming from the left and omega from the right. And okay, now the atom, um, if the atom was stationary, this laser beam here is not on resonance with the atom. So if it's, if it's stationary, if the atom was standing still, the laser beam is off resonance, so the probability to excite the atom is low. Um, that's good, maybe, be, because uh, in the end, if the atom was at a standstill, actually we don't want to push it with a laser beam anymore. But before that, now the atom is still moving, and okay, now a moving atom that moves here into this direction towards this left laser beam sees actually this laser frequency shifted. So the moving atom um, sees laser frequency 
shift in. by, and that's exactly the Doppler shift. So the same thing that makes you hear cars at a higher pitch when they come towards you, or the fire truck than when they move away from you. Higher pitch means more energy. So, so, so if, we're now, if we're moving towards that laser beam, and before it didn't have enough energy here, if we move towards it, Actually, we can see it shifted. So, so, so now we see a shift, delta omega, that is equal to uh, the k vector of the light times the velocity of my atom. And the k vector of the light is just, um, or the length of that vector is basically the inverse of the wavelengths. So lambda is the wavelength of the light. Uh, the inverse is basically the energy, how energetic that is. And now, okay, the atom is moving towards the laser, which in a stationary frame would have not been on resonance. And now actually uh, atom, uh, the atom has a higher probability to, to absorb the light. So atom absorbs photon. from counter-propagating beam. Okay, so, so it absorbs the photon. What does it mean? It means, okay, I had my electron sitting down here in the ground state, and now it's able to go here up to the excited state. Okay, that's a higher energetic state. It actually wants to go back to the ground state again. So, so it, it will spend a little time up there, maybe on the order of 10 nanoseconds, and then it will uh, emit again. So, 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 so let's, let's actually uh, draw this as a cartoon. We have uh, number one, number one uh, absorption. Absorption, so, so then, oh, yeah, let, let's do it like that. Uh, so, so we have the P of the atom, so the, the momentum of the atom. Of course, it has its initial momentum. It's traveling uh, with, with uh, some velocity, and now it absorbs a photon. The momentum of a photon is H bar K. That's uh, the fault. Uh, so, so now, actually, that's great. Uh, so, so we had this momentum in this direction. Oh. <laughs> and then now we absorb a photon, so we, we get a little bit slowed down. So that, that's excellent. But then uh, step number two, the atom doesn't want to stay in the excited state. Uh, it, it will emit a photon. And... After step number two, okay, this is very trivial, but it's just m v minus h bar k absorb plus h bar k emit. So this seems now, on the first glance, this seems like maybe we have won nothing. Okay, we, we <laughs> absorb a photon, we get a, a kick, uh, like a little push back. Now we emit a photon and we get some recoil. So, so, so now we, uh, and, and indeed, if we were emitting the photon kind of in the same direction from where the laser beam came, then uh, nothing actually uh, would have happened and, and the uh, atom would still be traveling at the same uh, speed. But now there's something different between uh, the absorption process and the emission process. And that is that now when we emit a photon, I'm, I'm going up here, so, so we absorb the photon from the counter-propagating beam, but we emit the photon isotropically in any direction. So this is, this is uh, my emission. And now there is actually some directionality because Okay, the atom emits 
in random direction um, and that means that if I would average over many of those processes and that's exactly what you would do in when you laser cool it's not enough to just excite it one time and and and, and then emit uh, but but you want to do it many times and then you average over all those directions of the emission and it would be a uh, uh, zero so so on average uh, you are not recoiling always in the same direction but on average you're recoiling in random direction and and that just uh, averages to zero so there is some directionality we get the pushback from the counter propagating beam we emit randomly and then in essence when we do that many times, the atom is slowed down. Yes. So, Professor, in the in the emission of the photon, the frequency of that photon is like about the same gap of the two levels, right? The photon emitted. Uh, yes. So, the probability of another atom to get that photon and get an excitation is negligible because the my environment has just a few atoms, or is this something that ah. we have to care about? Okay, that, 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 that's a great question. Um, I also I wasn't here last week. I could imagine that uh, Derek also talked about kind of what happens when you have many emitters around it, and and maybe about like refractive index and and so on. Here, it's so dilute you can forget about any atom around it. Later, later we are going to get into situations where that's not the case anymore, but here we can really treat each atom uh, completely uh, independent. So can I say that is like a Markovian interaction or stuff like that, to describe it as a Markovian model? Um, yeah, I guess if you want to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's good. Okay, so okay, atom is slowed down, but okay, now we 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 were in this situation here, where okay, we are absorbing from the counter propagating beam. It's it's slowed down. Eventually, uh, we might actually speed up again. We kind of push in this uh, direction more and more. Um, or I mean, if we at zero, we don't excite it that likely anymore. But even if we are off resonance, eventually we will excite it. So, so, so what we need is also this other beam going in the other direction. And then, okay, we want to slow down in three dimensions. So we need six, or we need at least uh, laser beams from all directions. Um, need to slow down in x, y, z. Uh, typical uh, six counter propagating laser beams. And okay, so so that that's why we have so many laser beams. And then the question already uh, was over there: what about magnetic fields? And I wasn't really planning to 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 discuss why in in detail we also need magnetic fields. But the story is basically: um, if if we just had okay, if we just had these, let's say. <laughs> like the situation where we now have these six laser beams that come in this direction and they also come from here and here and then in and out, then the atom would slow down, but actually it would slow down anywhere where these laser beams overlap. So I would have like a pretty big blob of atoms or slower atoms here. The combination with magnetic fields where I somehow make some point in space special because it has zero magnetic field, that can actually then even further bring the atoms actually to a central location. So, the, um, so that's kind of the hand wavy argument. So we combine this laser cooling um, with magnetic fields. Uh, 
uh, we combine it, and that is what is called a magneto magneto optical trap. And all that is, it's the optics gives you the slowing down, and the magnetic fields give you a spatial dependence of that slowing down, and, and what you get is a spatially spatially dependent uh, restoring force. So you made this point in the middle special, and whenever the atoms moves a little bit to the side or speeds up, then there's some force that pushes it back to the middle. So that, that's the whole purpose of a magneto-optical trap. Um, and, and out comes, out comes uh, a cold, cold ensemble, or we like to call that a cold cloud of spatially confined atoms. And, okay, here I have a picture. So I'm doing shameless self-advertising all the time, so this is just pictures out of my lab. Um, I think it's a nice one. Um, so here we are looking into this vacuum chamber, so, so we zoomed uh, even more in. And always the, the weird thing about laser cooling is that uh, actually the cold cloud of atom glows. So, so because uh, the atoms still move a little bit and then they get pushed back, and whenever they do that, uh, they emit a photon. So you have this blob of uh, atoms sitting there. They're actually very cold, they're extremely slow. If I was to for example, switch off the magnetic fields now, I lose that spatial confinement, atoms start to move, and they now would move maybe with millimeter per second. So we are not at 300 meters per second anymore, but we are kind of at millimeter per second, or maybe centimeter per second, so they are extremely slow, and uh, slow just means, okay, the temperature here, uh, uh, the temperature here is on the order of micro Kelvin. So pretty low. Uh, that means the velocity is on the order maybe centimeter per second. And my cloud, maybe typical number of atoms is maybe 10 to the 9 atoms that I have here. So tens or maybe 100 million atoms that are all nice and, and slow that sit there. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, pretty cool in, in literally, but also nice to look at. Um, actually, when you talk to a lot of um, hardcore atomic physicists, I, I don't count myself as a hardcore atomic physicist, but hardcore atomic physicists, they are very used to making Bose-Einstein condensates, uh, degenerate uh, gases, and then actually micro Kelvin to them seems like they always make fun of me and say it's lukewarm. So, so actually, micro Kelvin is in, in atomic temperatures. It's, it's not even that cold. People can go to maybe nano Kelvin or even sub nano Kelvin. But then you need uh, very different uh, cooling mechanisms, for example, evaporative cooling or um, to, to, to get to even lower temperatures. But it's actually really nice in this atom arrays. Uh, we don't have to do that. And that's, uh, I think, one reason why actually this atom array field is kind of exploding quite a lot because some of the experimental challenges are actually uh, not as big as making Bose-Einstein condensates. The challenges are then on un other fronts, as I will show you. Yeah. Uh, microphone. Thanks. Um, so about adding this magnetic field, um, so don't you also have like some kind of a Zeeman split splitting because of this? And like, is this thing problematic or? Um, yes, so, so okay, and, and we will get into that, uh, so, okay, I mean, the important thing, we, we always say, okay, we have two levels, <laughs> now, now we had maybe our 5P, no, 5S state, 5P state, uh, what we will see is that that's 
really too simple. So, so let's take rubidium. This is all rubidium. Actually, the, the uh, 5S stain, there's both electron spin, so, so somehow there must be more levels, but there's also nuclear spin. Uh, and uh, these two things coupled together, and then I actually get a manifold with total spin, uh, F equals 2 and F equals 1. And okay, then I have sublevels, MF, that go from 2 to minus 2. So I have uh, minus 2, minus 1, 0. So I have five sublevels here, and then F equals 1, minus 1. So, so these are my MF states. So this is 0, minus 1, 1. And then actually uh, all, all of that fun things I also have up there, so, and, and actually even more. So, so because here I have orbital angular momentum P, so I actually also have two different orbital angular momentum states, 3 half and 1 half. Um, and, and I have here actually in the 3 half, I have F equals 3, 2, 1, 0. So I actually have seven states here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 1. Uh, so there are many states. Um, um, okay, the, the, the point here is <laughs> to say there are many more states. But actually, the great thing is I will later show you the tools, how you can actually treat this and, and just uh, uh, dissect, uh, maybe just uh, speak to two states. But the question was, uh, Zeeman shifts or so, and now indeed in a magnetic field, these states, they might shift and tilt. Maybe they might shift like this. And, and this is actually exactly what we use in a magneto-optical trap, is this additional shift uh, to, to then have these uh, restoring forces. Um, yeah. But okay, there are indeed Zeeman shifts. Uh, but okay, m actually, w kind of the trajectory we are on, we are kind of now we have a lot of atoms, we have a lot of atoms uh, at <laughs> levels. Uh, in the end, we will just make it easier and easier. We get to a single atom. I'm going to show you how out of these many states we just uh, identify two or three and then work with those. So we actually, I always like to say to my students, actually, magneto optical traps is the most difficult thing. Kind of, it's actually very complex dynamics how how the atoms uh, behave in there. Once we have single atoms, everything becomes easy and nice. And that's but I don't know if I answered your question, but there are Zeeman shifts indeed, yeah. Okay, super. So, so okay, we have a cold cloud of atoms. Actually, we have way too many atoms. And I, I, I don't, or maybe later, maybe I would like 100 million atoms. But right now, I just want a few really well-controlled single atoms. So, so this is now number four, uh, trapping, trapping single atoms. And okay, when, whenever there is a challenge with atomic physics or so, now we want to trap a single atom. Uh, the most likely answer is, okay, uh, let's get another laser beam, let's get another laser light to, 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 to do this. So now we, uh, out of this cold cloud of atoms, we're going to trap single atoms using not magneto-optical trapping, but just uh, an optical, optical, and sometimes people, it goes by many names, but some people call it an optical dipole trap. And the idea here is that a detuned uh, laser shifts energy levels. So, what w so the situation is actually very similar to laser cooling. We also had two levels, and I said there's some detuning. Again, we want to talk to two levels. 
Uh, this could be the 5S and the 5P stain. And again, we, we are going to uh, shine in laser light. This time, this detuning is actually much, much larger. So we have a delta large. And here is an omega. And uh, what this will do, uh, what this will do, uh, just uh, even if, it, if the, we actually want to be so far detuned that we are rarely, if at all, exciting the atom. So, so we are so far detuned, you would say nothing happens. But actually something does happen. Actually just uh, the fact that there is this far detuned light field, this actually shifts these energy levels. So the energies get shifted uh, by some amount. Um, and actually, you're supposed to do also uh, like homework sets, right? Or, or we do some things together. So the question will be by how much it shifts. Or I'm, I'm let, let's make it a little easier. I'm going to tell you by how much it shifts, but uh, you are going to derive how and why. And then, then I actually want you to think as experimentalists, so, so we make it even more fun, and we try to add some numbers. Okay, so so l let's do this. So it shifts by omega squared. But so I'm not, yeah. No, every time I mix up a little prefactor, so this is always a good uh, chance to check those prefactors if you also uh, <laughs> calculate this. And uh, the, this is actually in this very simple picture of just two levels and one light field, so just a, a two-level system. This upper shift is also in the same magnitude, but one is going to be positive and one is going to be negative. So that's interesting. Um, uh, that is interesting. So, so just to give you... So the, the, the P set uh, will be calculate the shift. And I don't know, is there like an email I can, or, okay, we formula, I, I will formulate the questions. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, let's do that. Um, I'm, I'm just going to give you a little back background how you uh, would go about calculating this. So I, I know Derek already did quite some quantum optics last uh, week, so, so this is, way easier. This is uh, very, very easy. Uh, this is experimental. Uh, so here, it's just a two-level system that is driven by this light field. So, so the Hamiltonian of this is, maybe I, I write the Hamiltonian, I, I normalize it by H bar. It's just going to be, okay, the laser light can rotate basically drive Rabi oscillations between the ground and the excited state. So we are going to have, we are going to have uh, some off-diagonal elements. And okay, let's just say those are real. Or, um, uh, then basically you have an omega uh, over two here. So this is your sigma x term, if you think about uh, Pauli matrices. So you have a sigma x that rotates the thing. But okay, this was uh, this uh, now now thinking about the off-diagonal terms. The off-diagonal terms. This is where you get this detuning. So this is uh, where the delta is. So if you were just on resonance, uh, uh, this would just be zero, and you drive Rabi oscillations between the ground and the excited state. Now we actually want to be in a situation where this is very far off resonance. So so delta is really large. And then, okay, uh, you, you will get new eigenstates of, of, of the thing, and, and the energy of those eigenstates, that's what we are interested in. So, um, um, so okay, let's, let's really formalize it. Uh, question. And then I think on Thursday we have a tutorial, then we will just go over it, and I will add a little bit more... Uh, color uh, where, where uh, what this might mean. Question number one, uh, derive the energy shift of 
of this two-level system. I, I like to call it TLS. Then I don't have to write so much. So just the 5S and the 5P stays uh, with far of resonant light or laser, same thing. So just derive this omega squared uh, over 4 delta. And if you don't reach 4 delta, probably it means that I made some mistake or so. <laughs> so don't be uh, about the small factors, don't be too concerned. But, but we do it together on Thursday also. So do that. And then, OK, let's, let me actually uh, shift this question a little bit lower. We, we, I'm, I'm going to add a little bit more consideration. Um, so you're going to do that. And okay, we, we should think about, okay, where does this, I also want to, I want you to think about um, kind of practical quantities in the lab. Of course, you will be able to derive this or so, but then it's always the question, okay, how much does it shift and is this large or small? In the end, it will be about, okay, how much laser power do I have? What, what is realistic to actually shift it? And then uh, let's, Ask. So for that, uh, actually, to to um, to link these quantities to what is happening in the lab, we have to talk a little bit about the Rabi frequency. Uh, so the omega, and I don't know if, if if Derek did this, where where omega, how omega is kind of related to fields and dipoles, and a little bit. Anybody? Maybe maybe not so much. So so I'm gonna uh, give you just this omega. So this is the Rabi frequency, how fast you uh, rotate from the ground state to uh, the excited state. Omega is, or does anybody know what kind of omega is related to? Yeah. Field intensity, very good, very good. Dipole, exactly, exactly. So, so field intensity, so there's a dipole moment there. Uh, so there's a D. And field intensity is right. Often when I think about Rabi frequency, I might think about the field amplitude, maybe the electric field of, of the laser couples to, couples to the dipole moment, uh, couples to uh, ground to excited state. And so this might be uh, uh, just the absolute value of this. So this is the E field. Oh. E field of laser. And this is the dipole, or let's, I always like to call it transition dipole element. Basically, this is a quantity that uh, characterizes how strongly the atom likes to couple to light here, uh, or, or to the E field. And then I think to get units right or so, there's probably also H bar here. So, so this is the Rabi frequency. It's related to the uh, dipole transition uh, element and the electric field of a laser beam. And now I'm... I'm uh, so the first question is, is simple theoretical derivation. Now I want you to think about it like an experimentalist. So the second question is, um, okay, le okay, let's make it look up. Look up the dipole element. Uh, for the 5S, okay, we also have to define uh, the total angular momentum here, the 5S to 5P, one half, one half uh, transition in rubidium. So 
so yeah, l l just try Googling that or, or something. So that's going to give you the D. And now I'm still going to give you uh, the E. Uh, so so uh, this, is, uh, this is number one. And B, assume, assume you have, and let's say, um, Okay, how much how much laser power does a typical laser pointer have? Or or what is even the unit which with which I would measure then? Okay. Half a watt, what? Yeah, that 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 would be the kind of thing where you really burn yourself. Like if if you get that, okay, it really stinks. So and Every experimentalist does that. They put their hand in a laser beam and want to see, does it really hurt? It does really hurt, uh, actually. One word starts to hurt. I mean, it depends on the wavelength. So a typical laser pointer, also to be eye safe, also this, this is like a milliwatt. This, uh, this is like a milliwatt. So assume you have one milliwatt of laser line, laser line, and I need to give you a wavelength because in the end, the shift here will depend on delta. So delta is the detuning between your optical transition. So you also need to look up what is the optical, what is the wavelength of 5s one half to 5p one half. So he, there I drew the 5p three half. Uh, now I'm interested in the 5p one half. Uh, and I'm going to give you laser light at 810 nanometer. So longer wavelength means lower in energy. So I'm going to be red detuned, and not just by a little bit, but really by several nanometers. And now I have one milliwatt of laser light at 800 nanometer. Very importantly, now I gave you, now I gave you a power. Power, is not, power doesn't tell you much. Uh, uh, I mean, the power tells you something. I, I, I should also give you, like, you are going to focus this laser light down. So, so you have one milliwatt of laser light at 800 nanometer. Focus to, focus to, let's say, one micrometer squared. And and for, of course, uh, when you focus light. Uh, it has some intensity profile, but here you could just assume kind of an even, like you, you kind of make a spot that is one micrometer in diameter, or, 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 or the area of that. So you have one micrometer, one milliwatt of laser, at 810, nano, uh, 810 nanometer. And now the question, okay, assume that, calculate Uh, the energy shift. Okay, some, some number comes out. I don't know, and then the question will be, is it good or is it bad? Uh, and, and so the question will be, uh, can this trap uh, Okay, we had this cold cloud of atoms. We said they are uh, 10 microkelvin cold. Can this trap uh, a, a 10 microkelvin cold atom? So those are the, 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 the three questions. Oh, it's, it's four questions. Okay, there you go. So, so four questions. The first one is just, from the Hamiltonian, just two-level system, far detuned uh, driving, uh, derive the energy shift. And then the second one, think like an experimentalist. I also don't have those numbers in my head, so, so I would also look at the atom, look, ah, this looks like a good transition to trap on. I have no idea what the transition dipole element is. I look it up. Then I look in my lab, oh, I have some lasers, maybe at this wavelength. Maybe I have this much power, and then the question is, can I trap the atom? So the very experimentalist thinking. And yeah, play a little bit around with that. And also on, on, on Thursday, we are going to talk about that in detail. Yes, maybe I'm missing something. So 
I have, I think, uh, like a, a basic question, and if it's going to be a, a huge digression and to delay the class, uh, we can talk about it later. But what what is so special about far off resonance laser frequency? Why does it cause a uh, shift in the in the levels? What is the physical mechani mechanism behind it? Yeah, great question. So, uh, I mean, it's not a digression at all. It's actually, it is basically your homework. Why does it uh, shift the uh, energies? Uh, also, maybe sometimes people pick up names just by reading textbook, and actually this goes by many names. Uh, so, so, so maybe that then also sounds familiar. So, so the shift is called... Actually, that confused me in the beginning. I thought those were different things, but <laughs> it's all the same. So it could be the AC stark shift. Or people talk about light shifts. And also maybe in the quantum optic books that you would pick up, uh, you, you could also look at uh, dress states. So basically the physical mechanism is, okay, okay if you just had a two-level system and two energies, okay, that, that's the end of the story. Now you couple those two energies, so, so your Hamiltonian looks like this. Obviously this Hamiltonian is not diagonal anymore. So those will not be your energy eigenstates. Now you want to calculate what are your energy eigenstates. Those energy eigenstates then are called your dress states and those eigen energies uh, they, they will be your, your shifted energies, uh, basically. So, so that's, that's, I mean, that's how I think about the physical mechanism. You could also have like a, more like a classical picture where the atom is an oscillator and here's another oscillator and those two oscillators couple and, 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 and then they form uh, uh, two uh, different energy states. Uh, I yeah. think I get it. Thank you. Professor. Okay, okay, cool. No, it's a great question. Forty-five minutes, right? Fifteen minutes? Ah, yeah. Okay. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, but it's because you ask excellent questions. I love it. Thank you. Um, okay. This is. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 So. So th that's the homework. I'm. I'm going to add a little bit more. We we talked. I mean, not more questions. Uh, these are the questions, but uh, stuff that might help you. Uh, so there are different situations, of, of course, here. Uh, the frequency of the laser can be smaller than the frequency of the atom. This is actually uh, this is uh, what we call red detune. So you have, uh, the laser light has less energy, and now that's exactly the the situation which I drew, where this energy of the five s state goes down. So you want to be retitune. If you're retitune, you can create a situation where the atom atom is attracted to high intensity. Almost sounds counterintuitive. Uh, um, so. Uh, 5s state, 5p state, 5s state shifts lower in energy. And, and this shift here uh, is exactly proportional to the intensity of the light. Okay, there's also the dipole element or so. But that means, okay, the more intense light, the happier the atom and it wants to go there. And now you can already think, okay, how can I trap this atom? Obviously, I cannot trap this atom by just having like a big, large laser beam that's basically on the on the length scale of the atom, very homogeneous. So, so what you do there is that you actually, okay, and I will draw this later a bit more. Uh, you take a lens and a microscope objective. In our case, is just, I mean, my postdoc always says it's just a glorified lens. It's just a lens that works really well. Uh, and you send in a laser beam, and now you focus this laser beam very tightly. 
And okay, uh, 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 because oh, this is really bad drawing. Um, yes, and, and now you have a situation where, okay, the most intense point is here. So the atom wants to go to the focus of a laser spot. That, that's in the rectitude regime. Um, and, and I will talk about this a tiny bit more. Uh, and but the other regime could also be nice. You could have the laser uh, that is of higher energy or higher frequency than the transition of the atom. Uh, this is blue detune. And now you can uh, push the atom around. Now the atom is repelled. And actually, uh, both situations uh, can be used for trapping. It's only uh, that this first situation is quite a bit easier. In the second situation, somehow you have to create a laser beam that basically has a hole in the middle. So, so you want to make something that has no intensity in the middle, and then whenever the atom would move left or right, it gets pushed back. That's what people call a bottle beam. It's a bit weird. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, so um, coming back to the stark shift thing, so should I think of it as a uh, like thing which I can treat in perturbation theory, or uh, because like in this case, like it's just like two by two matrix, so like I can always diagonalize, but like. Yeah. In general, like, is it a perturbative effect or not really? Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 like uh, like those shift is like you can think of it as a second order perturbation. Mm. And in the end, what's also important is atoms has so many levels. So, so you actually want to add up all the effect of all the levels, uh, but it will just be okay. Whatever level is closest to the laser light that you send in will contribute the most because there's this one over delta, so that will be the, the strongest effect. That, uh, that's why when we kind of estimate things, we just pick, for example, this 8, 10 nanometer, then we check what's the closest transition, and then we first just take that one. Mm. Yeah. And why does the first order vanish for perturbation theory? Why does this vanish? Um, I mean, the maybe it has to do the the dipole element is 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 uh, I mean an atom doesn't have a permanent dipole moment so so mm. so I, I I can't couple the same state with the same state I only oh have okay to, uh, okay I see I see cool thanks yeah yeah great question <coughs> okay so I have eleven more minutes oh yeah no this is way better than me covering stuff yeah. Um. Hey. But for this laser cooling, you have to start from the ground state. I mean, the, the initial state 5S in this case is the ground state of the atom, right? It has to be or not. Yes, yeah, it depends a little bit what you mean by ground state. Often I think of this here. Sometimes I think of this whole manifold as my ground state. It actually doesn't matter where exactly the atom sits. All of these states, they will be shifted down by this laser light. Okay, no, simply the question. Because, uh, uh, because I kind of these, like and, and, and if we were kind of like these energy differences here, maybe is a, sorry, I use a lot of deltas. Uh, let's say small delta hyperfine is on the order of maybe seven gigahertz. The, the kind of far off resonant detuning we talk about here is maybe a terahertz or so. So it doesn't resolve any of this kind of. Like, uh, yeah, it doesn't resolve any of this. All of these kind of shift down by almost the same amount. Uh, so I don't have to prepare a certain state here. They will all shift down. But you are right, I have to be in the ground state. Actually, the excited state, because we saw it actually shifts up, is blue detune. Mm -hmm. That's actually a problem. If I spend too much, if this excited state was very long lived, I go up there. Now I'm blue detuned. Now I start pushing the atom away. So actually, I need this excited state to be uh, kind of short-lived, and I also don't want to excite the atom too often. Otherwise, every time I excite it, I just push it a little bit away. That's kind of actually uh, making a little bit of a heating mechanism in these uh, traps. You want to be very far off resonant, but sometimes you're excited, and when you're excited, then 
you start pushing it with the blue detuned uh, 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 with uh, with that l laser line. Yeah. Thank you. Super. And okay, there are a lot of levels. All of this is just to make it easier because now you know basically how out of these 100 million atoms you trap a single atom. So five trapping a single atom. And this is exactly the picture that I drew there. I'm trying to make it more pretty and more colors. So we have a red detuned laser uh, beam. We shine it through a lens. And we focus it tightly. And okay, if this was ray optics, that's maybe the first uh, mistake that I also did when I didn't know optics so well. Then you think, okay, you focus beams and then you have this infinitely small spot here. That's not how it works. There's some diffraction limit. It's Gaussian optics. So that's why I'm uh, drawing these curved uh, beams here. And, and this, uh, how closely you can focus in, this is called the beam waste. It's often called omega zero. So the omega zero is approximately equal to f. f here is the focal length. Uh, the focal length uh, times lambda. So the smaller the wavelength, the tighter you can focus it. Uh, there's a factor two. Doesn't really matter. There's also a factor pi. Also doesn't really matter. Uh, but then there's a D here. That D is basically the opening here, how large your beam comes in. So when you, when you um, want to focus a beam tightly, you want to have a really big lens, basically. Uh, you want to have a very small focal distance. And potentially, you want to have a small wavelength. The wavelength we cannot choose because uh, uh, we want to maybe pick the wavelength that is nice for trapping. Uh, the focal length, maybe we can choose somewhat, but as you, like it's, like some experiments, they actually put mic lenses or microscopes inside. Uh, there's a big advantage actually keeping those outside. It also helps with your vacuum. So you, you will have some distance between your last lens and where your atoms are. That's kind of setting what this ratio of opening angle is. You can also not have an objective that's this large and uh, uh, focal uh, uh, distance. So, so this F over D is also sometimes called the numerical aperture. Um, yeah, so... so if you want to focus tightly, so to have tight trapping, uh, we need D over F large. And the thing that makes that one can be nice lens or we can just use a microscope objective. And those are normally characterized with a quantity that's called the numerical aperture, but it's just that ratio, d over 2f. Uh, and let's say you have a lot of money. Uh, then, you, you, then you buy a, <laughs> a nice microscope objective. Do I, I, I personally not, but, <laughs> but uh, we, we do buy nice things in labs. So for example, in our lab, we have a microscope objective of an A65. So that basically means, okay, the opening of the lens is as big as, as the focal distance, roughly. So it's pretty big, and it's kind of a complicated lens system. Okay, I mean, let's talk dollar amounts. That cost about $50,000 uh, to, to have a lens like that. And our trapping wavelength 
kind of that's why I'm choosing these examples is 810 <laughs> nanometer. So this is nice for rubidium. Uh, and then you would get a waste. And that's just Gaussian optics. Often this waste is not the diameter, but it's the radius. So, so that is on the order of, uh, of 500 nanometers. So that's why I give you as an example, let's think of a one micrometer spot in diameter. That's kind of what you would typically get in these, um, uh, in these uh, microscopes. A any questions there? Okay, and then, then uh, in, in the two minutes I have, now, now we have created a special situation. Atoms want to go here into the middle. No? They, they are attracted there. So it's basically a potential uh, well I'm, I'm, I'm rolling down. Uh, I want to go there. But okay, I have many atoms, so, so, so many atoms want to go there. In, in the experiments later, you want to say I have one spin here or I have one qubit here. Um, so the question is really how many atoms are trapped? And in principle, you would say there's no uh, cap. Like if you keep this on longer, you will accumulate more atoms. Uh, and that, that would not be great. But it's actually, there's a very useful mechanism. Uh, and it's called light assisted collisions. It's just a name. Um, and this effect guarantees that you have zero or one atom. And th this only happens when you have a tight focus. So when you have a focus on the order of, of maybe a micrometer, actually the principle of what happens is, okay, this is just a, a, a conservative potential, so atoms fall into here. But now, okay, you have one atom there, then now a second atom comes, nothing stops the atoms from coming there. But now actually there are two atoms that have very closely overlapped, they are quite close. They actually form kind of a loosely bound molecule. And when you excite that molecule, for some uh, atomic or molecular reasons, and, and I will uh, show that, uh, they actually, both atoms gain enough energy that they both get kicked out of the trap. So it's kind of funny, you, you just point this laser beam into your magneto-optical trap, atoms want to go there, and they go there, you can think of it one by one, you put one atom in it, everything is fine, you put a second atom in it, and once you excite them also, you have this molecular state that gains enough energy that kicks out both atoms, and you end up again with zero. That's why, because of these light-assisted collisions, you always have zero or one atom, and that's extremely useful kind of ensures that you never are in doubt. When you see some atoms, you don't think, is it one, two, or three? No, you know it's one atom. Yeah. That's your last sentence. That's my today. last sentence. That's your last sentence. We, we arrived from 100 million atoms to one. So. Cool. Are there final questions we want to take? If not, let's thank Anes again. Thank you. and we'll be conveyed in half an hour.